Good morning. Uh, I uh, got here yesterday afternoon, and I've already met a lot of interesting people and saw a lot of interesting things. I'm going to cover three areas in the next 15 to 20 minutes, so it'll be at about the 65,000 feet level. Talk a little bit about U.S. manufacturing and policy strategies, some manufacturing innovation, and then conclude with the IMS program. Uh, <clears throat> and the theme of the whole area will be collaboration. So uh, U.S. manufacturing strategy and policy, we're, we do about $1.6 trillion in manufacturing, and it represents about 60% of the U.S. exports. Uh, also, the manufacturing industry accounts for about 70% of the public sector R&D in the United States. We are losing ground, however, as uh, trade gap is starting to widen to about $100 billion. Uh, so this has got people concerned. Uh, the The president uh, set up a council of advisors to study these issues, uh, and, and the report came out recently, I think it's available, uh, that it reminded us how important manufacturing is to a country. And the government should play an important role through the development of innovation policy. Now, we've always, the government's always supported uh, basic research with the universities, but this report suggested that we also should co-invest in pre-competitive applied research and development. Does that sound uh, uh, familiar? Think uh, the framework programs in the EUs, in the EU. So this PCAS report uh, also looked at other areas like taxes and trade and workforce requirements. It's a pretty comprehensive report. Uh, and uh, given, given uh, the recommendations out of the report, uh, the president has made revitalization of manufacturing a key part of his economic strategy. Uh, we feel like in the United States, uh, the U.S. manufacturers face about a 20% cost burden over other developed countries. Uh, there's some charts there. I don't know if you can read them, but, and I have a bunch of backup charts that if you go to the website, you'll probably be able to pick up facts on things. But this 20% of a lot of it is caused by just corporate taxes. And we do have the highest uh, Japan was kind of tied with us in 2010, but they've lowered their taxes a little bit. So we're sitting at a 40% burden. And I think the government is now recognizing that that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, so the president has established an office of manufacturing policy, and we've never really had that. And it's going to be uh, co-chaired by the Secretary of Commerce and the director of the National Economic Council. Uh, the president's FY13 budget for advanced manufacturing is $2.2 billion US dollars, and that's about a 19% increase over 2012. So that's, that's good news for at least US manufacturers. There's other policy uh, issues that are in the backup slides that I won't go into now. Uh, but let me just say that the president understands that uh, to build an economy at last, you need a very strong manufacturing sector. We all knew that all along, but uh, some people were just realizing that, that you got to build things. It's important. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple manufacturing innovations that I think are important. Uh, to the future. One, which is no stranger to this group, is additive manufacturing. Gee, yesterday I heard a really good briefing on additive manufacturing. I talked to several other people who are working in that area. Certainly this isn't a new concept. 
Uh, additive manufacturing has been going on now for about 20 years, but it is, it is reaching the, the time frame now where it's going to become very important. And I even overheard uh, some Airbus folks talking about some point in the future being, out, being able to print out a, parts of almost the whole airplane. Now, I don't know if I go along with that, but on the other hand, you can look forward to the digital manufacturing, additive manufacturing, 3D printing is an important area of innovation. Another area which I want to apply to manufacturing is crowdsourcing. And most of you understand crowdsourcing, uh, which is, takes advantage of, of resources throughout the whole world, can. I believe that small and medium-sized manufacturers will take advantage of this to solve tough manufacturing problems. I don't believe larger companies will use crowdsourcing to solve their problems. They're worried about IP. All the lawyers will be getting in their way and you know they just won't do it. But we, we feel like that's gonna be an important way to solve problems using the world as your resource. Another area that you may not be familiar with is what we call service-oriented manufacturing. Uh, it's just starting to get a little traction in the United States. It involves uh, uh, it, <coughs> it involves uh, service-oriented architectures, cloud computing. It basically treats manufacturing as a service. Now that kind of hurts me a little bit. It doesn't sound so good to me as a as a uh, certainly an engineering supporter. I but so maybe we've misnamed this, but it treats manufacturing as a set of services. And you know, the, the concept of the future is you'd wake up in the morning in your house and you'd be running a manufacturing plant and you could use small and medium sized manufacturers. They will have to develop very agile, flexible uh, centers and you'll be able to look and see where the best capability is available at the time to solve your problems in manufacturing. I have three or four papers on that. If, some, if you want to get to me later, I can get those to you. And one I kind of left out is uh, model-based enterprise. And, I, and the reason I, f I forgot about it, I went out to the, this, this uh, Advanced Manufacturing Research Center. The, uh, they have a truck out there. And it reminded me, and, it's, and if you haven't been out there, you ought to go out there, but it reminded me of how important it is to be able to simulate capability in manufacturing, to model it. And I'm talking about the whole life cycle. I'm not talking about the design. I'm talking about even modeling how you're gonna dispose of something at the end of life. That's gonna become very important. <coughs> So I, I look at those four areas as important future areas. I think there are obviously others. The last piece of what I'm gonna talk about is the IMS program, and that's, I hope everyone knows what that is. It's Intelligent Manufacturing Systems. It, uh, this is kind of a lengthy side. Uh, the concept was actually developed by the Japanese in the early 90s to have worldwide participation and collaboration in areas that are mostly pre-competitive areas, and we consider sustainable manufacturing as a, as a very pre-competitive area. So they looked at uh, that area, and the IMS program now has been going on for close to you know 15 to 20 years, something like that. Uh, we have, uh, it's organized with an international steering committee. The chairman's here today. Uh, also the secretariat, the chairman is Fred Hoyer. Gunther, he's available. The secretariat, uh, Dan Nagy's available. And the reason I bring their names up is uh, that we're having a World Manufacturing Forum in mid-October. It's the second one, it's invitation only, and I would think this group here would be very interested in being there. If you can get your business cards to any of those folks or myself, we can get you an invitation to this meeting. It's in Stuttgart, it's a two day session. Last year was in Lake Como, it was a very successful meeting. 
this is kind of obvious why an IMS. Uh, we now, you know, we're certainly wired internationally. It gives us an opportunity to collaborate more. Uh, this is not just bilateral collaborations, it's multilateral collaborations. And uh, I think it's a very effective way to do a lot of your comp pre competitive manufacturing work. Uh, the vision of IMS, it's to open and enlarge worldwide markets, improve the utilization and efficiency of resources, improve the quality of manufacturing, advance manufacturing professionalism. We even look at uh, a, a degree in manufacturing engineering that would be an international degree. If you got that degree, you could work anywhere in the world with the same kind of processes. Uh, it's a very important program as I see it. Uh, right now we have five regions that are involved, heavily involved. The EU is considered one re region, but it includes all the 27 countries. Uh, the United States has been involved since the onset of the program, and uh, we, we will be the new chairman starting this November, the United States will be. There are actually five manufacturing technology platforms and the number one platform is sustainable manufacturing. And we see that as a, as a huge area in the future and it's gonna require collaboration across the international front to make it happen. So how do you get involved in an M uh, uh, IMS program? One thing is, is you need, there needs to be three participating regions. The program has gotta be at least a million dollars or more overall and, and, and last 12 months. But it can be put together with a simple MOU. And you, can you imagine if your company wanted to do a, a multilateral collaboration, how difficult that is without a structure in place? Well, the IMS provides that structure. So we're pretty bullish on the program overall. Um, I, as I promised, I'm going to finish up on schedule here. Uh, and in conclusion, I'd say that, that the IMS provides a very strong framework for collaboration, specifically in sustainable manufacturing. And we look at this capability as raising the level of the water across the world and enhancing the quality of life. Uh, I'll be available the rest of the day for questions. I know we're running a little behind, but uh, uh, if you want to talk about any of these subjects, please just look me up. I'll be in the hall.